Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. My name is Karen Hansen. I'm a rheumatologist at the University of Wisconsin. I've been here about almost 20 years now and um, have had the privilege of working in the UW Osteoporosis Clinic pretty much about that whole time and also now I'm working in the VA Osteoporosis Clinic. Um, I gave the, the talk I'm going to give you now at the American College of Rheumatology. So um, disclaimer, if you went to that meeting, uh, you're going to hear it again if you saw it there. <laughs> Um, so one of the more, more challenging things I think we face in our clinical practice of osteoporosis is drug holidays. And let's see why my slides won't go forward. There we go. No conflicts. Um, these are my key references. And two of them are um, drug holiday studies. And the other is the ASBMR task force statement on uh, drug holidays after bisphosphonate use. So I'm just going to go through the two clinical trials that studied bisphosphonate drug holidays. These were randomized con uh, placebo-controlled trials. And then um, just ponder with you the patient characteristics that might affect your decision to recommend a drug holiday. And then there's some interesting um, research on how to monitor a drug holiday, including timing of subsequent bone density tests. I'm going to skip. Uh, the background slides, but go to the terminal half-life of a Leonard Aiton bones. This was a study done way back in the 1990s. Women admitted to a metabolic unit and given a Leonard Aiton and had metabolic studies for on multiple time points uh, for a year. And based on that study, they estimated that the terminal half-life of a Leonard Aiton bone was right around 11 years. So that um, opens up the possibility of a drug holiday where the medication is still continuing to suppress bone breakdown even after it's discontinued. And some of the benefits of a drug holiday might be to reduce side effects, the more common things like gastric irritation, and the more uh, rare but serious uh, issues like subtrochanteric fractures or jaw necrosis. Um, patients like the idea of drug holidays because they'd like to stop taking their weekly medication and waiting an hour before they eat. Uh, cuts down on their costs of coming to clinic, having labs, and paying for medications. And then there's a societal benefit of reducing medical costs so long as we're not causing more fractures. What are the possible harms of a drug holiday? Well, obviously, we don't want to have a patient experience a new fracture. Um, we can expect to see some declines in bone density during a drug holiday. Um, a bigger concern is loss to follow-up and reduced adherence to bone-healthy lifestyle habits like exercise, um, adequate calcium, vitamin D protein intake, and um, avoiding bone toxins like tobacco and excess alcohol. So I'm going to um, go over the two trials um, that studied drug holidays in reverse order with the more recent um, publication going over that first. Um, and you'll see why in a couple minutes. So um, this was a study where they recruited postmenopausal women with osteoporosis into the initial trial, received once a year zoledronic acid or placebo for three doses. And at the end of that trial, there was a 70% reduction in spine and 40% reduction in hip fractures. Then uh, women were asked to be in the extension trial if they had already received three doses of zoledronic acid in the first trial. And here's just a study design. Um, basically what we're looking at is about 1,200 women who were in this extension trial. Half got six years of zoledronic acid and half got um, six of zoledronic acid and uh, I'm sorry, three of zoledronic acid and three of placebo. And um, just to keep in mind, the primary outcome of the study at, um, was um, simply looking at bone density at the femoral neck, not fractures. Um, but of course, we're interested in the fractures. And so the interesting thing about this trial was there was no difference in non-vertebral fractures, whether women got six or three doses of zoledronic acid. There was a small but statistically significant difference in the risk of morphometric uh, vertebral fractures, with 3% of women on the six doses of zoledronic acid getting fracture, and then 6% of the women getting three doses of zoledronic acid having a fracture. But the absolute numbers were very low. Um, 
The other drug holiday study was um, the classic FLEX trial. Um, so really the point of the study was to compare changes in hip bone density between women taking alenonate for five years versus 10. Um, they, um, the all but one center participated in this extension trial. Uh, there was one center out of the out of the fracture intervention trial that wasn't part of this study. And again, this is um, smaller than the initial trial, but about 1,100 postmenopausal women who had taken alenonate for at least three years in FIT. Um, they had to have a stable or increased hip T-score compared to FIT baseline, and their hip T-score had to be better than minus 3.5 to be eligible for the extension trial. So just again, a cartoon of, of what this looked like. So among about 3,200 women assigned to a Leonard Eaton fit, um, about 1,100 agreed to this extension trial, a third of them assigned to placebo and two thirds to different doses of a Leonard Eight. And these women were in their 70s, lower body mass index compared to most older uh, adults. Almost everyone was white and a third had prior compression fractures. And this is probably a familiar side to you that um, interestingly, now let me explain what we're looking at because the way they portrayed the data is a little bit confusing. In the left-hand side, which is the FIT trial, the open circles are alendronate, but in the right-hand side, which is the FLEX extension trial, the open circles are actually um, placebo. <laughs> so what you'll see is that there was an increase in bone density during FIT, a little dip in total hip bone density if you were assigned a placebo in the FLEX trial, um, fairly stable femoral neck bone density if on placebo, a little dip in trochanter bone density on placebo, and a continued gain in spine bone density if you switched over to placebo during FLEX. But this is the real um, interesting part of the study that essentially there was no difference in morphometric um, vertebral fractures or non vertebral fractures. Um, there was a small difference in clinical fractures if you continued a Leonardate for 10 years versus uh, five. So there's been a lot of post hoc analyses of the FLEX trial, and that's why I chose to present this um, trial second, even though it was published first. Um, and so I'll just go through some of the interesting post hoc analyses. Um, Dennis Black looked at whether he could identify um, subsets of women who might benefit for, from 10 years of a Leonardate versus only five. Um, and it looked like there was some benefit if you had a prior vertebral fracture and a low femoral neck T-score, you would only need to treat 17 people to prevent one painful compression fracture. Likewise, if your hip T-score was still minus 2.5 or lower, it looked like you would benefit from continued treatment. Um, problem is these confidence intervals are fairly wide. And so how, how much we can take that to the bank for every single patient is, is a little bit of a debate. Um, another postdoc analysis of FLEX looked at whether there, were, there was an ability to predict which women would fracture during the FLEX study. So um, surprisingly, the new fractures were not predicted by the one-year change in hip bone density, nor were they predicted by the one-year change in n peptide or the one-year change in bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. However, the new fractures were more likely if women had a femoral neck T-score indicating osteoporosis at the end of taking the Leonardate, or they had a 3% or greater decline in total hip bone density over a two-year interval. And I think that's helpful because um, the ASBMR task force really hones in on this data and making their suggestions on how to, um, how to offer a bisphosphonate drug holiday, who to offer it to. I just wanted to throw in the FDA systematic review. Um, what they did is they actually looked at FLEX, the Zoledronate extension trial, and they included a, about 150 women who were on open label um, resedronate in an extension trial, but it wasn't double blinded. Um, it wasn't a double blind placebo controlled trial to study um, the benefits of stopping versus continuing bisphosphonate. Nevertheless, they grouped all this data and they basically saw very similar fracture rates in women who were treated with bisphosphonates for six or more years compared to those treated for less than six years. 
And they said these data raised the question of whether continued bisphosphonate therapy imparts additional fracture protection relative to stopping therapy after five years. So um, the ASBMR uh, put out some guidelines on how to think through a bisphosphonate drug holiday. Um, so they start with the idea that you've got a postmenopausal woman treated with five years of oral or three years of intravenous bisphosphonate. And the first question to ask is, did this individual have hip, spine, or multiple other fractures during or before therapy? And if yes, then that individual might benefit from continued bisphosphonate or changing to a different medication. But if no, then the next step is to look at the HIP uh, T-score and if it's still indicating osteoporosis or the patient remains at high risk of fracture to then consider continuing the bisphosphonate or changing to a different osteoporosis drug. But if no, then consider a drug holiday and reassess in two to three years. And then they defined high fracture risk as age 70 years and older, a FRAC score at the end of that um, course of therapy that remained above country specific thresholds for treatment. So in our, in our case, that'd be a FRAC score of 20% or higher. Um, new drug or diagnosis. Um, so examples would be prednisone, taking an aromatase inhibitor or luprolide, or continued low hip uh, T-score. Since that publication, there have been numbers of other society guidelines being published. More, and I looked at these, they're very similar to what the ASBMR put out initially. So um, I'm just sharing with you a patient story. This is kind of a made up patient actually. Um, but just to kind of walk through my thought process on how I do this in clinic. So I'm gonna introduce you to Betty. She's a 65 year old woman who had a femoral neck T-score at minus, of minus 2.5 at her welcome to Medicare health visit. And at the time her FRAC score was 20% based on her age, a maternal hip fracture at age 70 and her hip T-score. So she was treated with alendronate for five years. Her bone density was stable at the one year mark. And then she came back after taking alendronate for five years to discuss a drug holiday. And these are the things I, I think about when I'm contemplating whether um, I think it's smart to offer a bisphosphonate drug holiday, which includes a drug holiday from all osteoporosis drugs actually in this scenario. So the first and I guess easiest question I ask myself is, would I treat her now based on her FRAC score? So I recalculate the FRAC score based on her current bone density values. Second question, did she adhere to therapy? And we know that people need to take at least 70, 75% of their medications for uh, them to truly work for this disease. Did she sustain spine, hip, or other fractures before or during therapy? And what happened to her, her bone density during therapy? If it decreased, I would be um, more anxious that um, stopping therapy just would not be the right thing for this individual. Does she still have a hip T-score indicating osteoporosis? How often does she fall? And does she have an ongoing risk factor for bone loss, like taking prednisone, diagnosis of cancer, or active weight loss? Um, we know that postmenopausal women who lose weight also lose bone density. And then finally, and um, absolutely important, is what does my patient really prefer to do too, based on um, the evidence before us at this visit? So going back to Betty, um, if I recalculate her FRAC score based on her current femoral neck T-score, it's actually 18%. So would I treat her now based on her FRAC score? I mean, I might because her FRAC score is really close to 20%, but the fact is she's been on treatment for five years. So reasonable to think about a drug holiday. Did she adhere to a Leonardate? By golly, she took it every Sunday before church. Doesn't think she missed a dose. Um, she didn't have any kind of fractures before or during therapy. Her bone density actually increased on therapy and her hip T-score no longer indicates a diagnosis of osteoporosis. She's not fallen within the past year and she has no active um, or ongoing risk factor for bone loss. And then what does she wanna do? Well, she would really like to stop medication with the understanding that we would wanna monitor her bone density over time and may well need to resume therapy later on. So I say, Betty, have a great holiday. Uh, 
So here's another patient of mine. I've changed her name and that's not her real picture, but Debbie is a 65 year old woman who had premature menopause. Her primary care doctor started her on raloxifene at age 50 to treat osteoporosis, but she had a low trauma wrist fracture and humerus fracture while on raloxifene. She was switched to alenonate for five years and had a significant decline in bone density and two vertebral fractures during that regimen. So then she came to see me in clinic and um, started teriparatide, had a nice response to that. And she receives oleronic acid to solidify gains in bone density and strength. Um, and her first year after zoledronic acid, she had uh, further um, stability or increase in spine bone density. But then at the um, final, uh, after three years, she'd actually had a dip in bone density again. Um, many workups for osteoporosis, no secondary cause identified. And her mom had a low trauma hip fracture at age 70. Her current femoral neck T-score is minus three. She's slender. And if we pretend she's never been treated, her FRAC score is actually pretty high, almost 40%. So just going through the same set of questions again, would I treat her now based on her FRAC score? Absolutely, I would. Was she adherent to therapy? She was. Um, did she sustain uh, fractures during therapy or before? Yes. Um, on zoledronic acid, her bone density dropped, and yes, she still has osteoporosis at the hip. Now she's otherwise very healthy, doesn't fall, has no other medical conditions, and she really doesn't want to have more fractures. She saw what happened to her mom after hip fractures, so she's really wanting to continue therapy. So this is an individual there. I would um, actually likely switch her to romosozumab or denosumab since she didn't have a good response to zoledronic acid. I just want to make the comment that um, we don't have any data on bisphosphonate drug holidays for patients on glucocorticoid therapy. And I also want to point out that um, when we're looking at these drug holiday studies, it's almost 100% Caucasian woman. So I think we just need to acknowledge that we don't have um, data in men or non-Caucasians to really guide us in those populations. And I treat them the same way, but I, I just have to confess that I don't know if that's the right thing to do. Four minutes. Okay, so monitoring the drug holiday, you know, specific guidance to the patient is continue her lifestyle habits that are healthy, exercise, especially strength and balance to reduce falling, specific guidelines on calcium, vitamin D, protein intake, calling me if they have a new clinical fracture, and screening for silent compression fractures by height loss, and then when are we going to remeasure the bone density? And very quickly, this was just some data from the FLEX5 uh, study. And basically what they did is they looked at the hip T-score at the end of five years of alendronate, and they said, how long would it take um, for 20% of women in that particular category to transition to osteoporosis at the hip? And I just want to point out that if your T-score was um, minus 1.9 or higher, um, in this analysis, it took more than five years to transition back to osteoporosis. Um, however, if you're close to minus 2.5, very little time to transition. So this is what I do. I actually write out recommendations very specifically, including when to repeat the bone density test, when to contact me or come back to clinic, and um, just to call me with any questions or concerns. So in summary, um, it's reasonable to consider bisphosphonate drug holiday if the patient is at low risk of fracture at five, after five years of oral or three years of intravenous bisphosphonate, but perhaps not to do a drug holiday in somebody who's still at high risk of fracture, has had prior compression or hip fractures, still has osteoporosis at the, fit, at the hip, or has an ongoing risk factor for bone loss. Um, and if they're still at high risk, your options are to continue or switch to a different uh, drug. Just keep in mind, we don't have any safety, da safety data for more than 10 years of alenonate. Um, and I think the patients just um, need to invest in the idea of monitoring their bone health um, and being aware that there may be a time that they will indeed have to resume therapy. Um, if the FRAC score rises above a threshold, if they've had a 3% decline in bone density two years after starting their drug holiday, or obviously if they've had a new fracture.
Okay, thank you very much. Very nice talk. Uh, Dr. Shaker has requested to make some comments. That was a great talk, Karen. And I have to admit, I am much more conservative than the ASBMR guidelines, and I tend to give more patients holidays than would meet their criteria because I am worried about side effects. But I would, in your structure, I would suggest one additional question, and that is, is it an Asian woman? Mm, Asian women question. are probably threefold higher risk for atypical fractures. And given that, the yeah. risk benefit ratio changes dramatically of going more than five years. Well, so and Joe, another, another counter to that would be, should we be treating our Asian patients with 35 milligrams of alendronate instead of the 70? Great, great comment. But yeah, I'm just saying that I, as, with the structure you have, I would be more conservative in, about extending an Asian, women of Asian descent. I don't know if other people, if anybody else is uh, concerned about that or has thoughts about that. Okay, we'll maybe come back to that. Um, there's another question. Do you always give ZA for three years after teriparatide? No, uh, sometimes we'll give it for a shorter period of time and it really depends on the individual. Okay. Uh, when would you consider repeating a course of anabolic treatment in these patients? Ah. I mean, the first question is, will we get it by their insurance plan? And I've been almost 100% unsuccessful <laughs> in getting insurance to cover a second course of anabolics. I've been able to do it a couple times. Um, and I think it's reasonable to do it. I mean, we just had the 15 year safety data, no higher risk of osteosarcoma in a long period of observation of using teriparatide in this country. I think it's reasonable to do it. I just don't know how I get it paid for by the insurance plan. Joe, do you wanna say anything about that? I, I have done it a few times. And it's usually when the patients changed insurance that yeah. it's the only time I've been able to get it approved. Yeah. So whether it's appropriate or not, I don't know. Don't yeah. assume what they don't need to know, Karen. This is <laughs> well, sometimes, somehow they find it. I don't know. Um, if it's the same insurance, they know. Yeah, they do. They know. But uh, I mean, I guess the other thing is we've got the romosozumab as another option. So I had a woman with the with severe osteoporosis, broke two hips, was on a lenonate for almost 10 years. Then she had a subtrochanteric hip fracture, stopped drug, was not being treated for osteoporosis for five years, and then had another um, low trauma fracture. And I did a bone biopsy on her. And she, at this point, she just had normal run-of-the-mill osteoporosis, no low bone turnover. And so I put her on uh, two years of anabolic. And at the end, um, her, her subtrochanteric fracture has never healed, even after two years of anabolic. So I ended up putting her on romosozumab as her next treatment. <laughs> and I pray, she has an x-ray in December and I'm just praying to see a tiny little callus form there. But I wish I could have given her more anabolic. But. Yeah, I, I, Karen, I think Mike, I, I agree with Joe. I think this was a great talk. And, and my comment is that, um, uh, I, you know, I, I tell all the fellows, you need to be comfortable with the way that you practice. Um, but I think like you, I have no qualms about using a second or for that matter, a third course of an anabolic agent if we can get it by the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the two-year prohibition is... Uh, is unfounded. And the way I've gotten it covered in the two patients I actually did succeed was they were on prednisone and I said, here's the prednisone clinical trial using teriparatide for 36 months and there was no harm seen and this is the exact circumstance where it is so effective to reverse the harmful effects of prednisone. Um, but yeah. Okay, one more question. Uh, like Asians being at a higher risk of AFF, those on glucocorticoids are also at higher risk of AFF and ONJ. 
but the patient is at a higher risk of further bone loss and fractures while being on glucocorticoids. I know you said there's, this is a data-free zone, but what are your thoughts on drug holidays in these patients? Um, it really depends on their prednisone dose and their FRAC score. Um, I might offer somebody a drug holiday if they've been on uh, a lenernate or a bisphosphonate for three to five, well, three years of zoledronic acid or five years of a lenernate and their new FRAC score is closer to 10. But now if it's closer to 20, I'm going to really be reluctant or worried about offering them a drug holiday. Um, the other thing is the dose of prednisone truly does matter. So if their prednisone dose is greater than 7.5 milligrams, the instructions are to multiply the FRAC score by um, upwards, you multiply by 1.15, so 15% higher risk of fracture because of that higher dose of glucocorticoids. Okay, we do have one more question, if we can address this quickly. Can you clarify the reason for reduced dose for Asian women? Is it due to their low BMI and or to continue for longer duration, more than five years versus 10 years at low dose? I assume we are yet to see studies to find out the outcome of treatment with low dose and longer duration uh, is safe, but the same. So it's my understanding that in the Japanese trials using alenonate, they actually prescribed the 35 milligram dose in, in the studies conducted in Japan. And it became whatever the Japanese equivalent of FDA approval is, it became approved for use in Japan based on that 35 milligram uh, dose. And there's some thought that um, it's not just hip geometry, but also just the fact that we're giving a standard adult dose to these um, women who are tend to be smaller, um, may not need as high of a dose of um, alenonate. So, we know that they have a higher risk of atypical femoral fractures, and we know some of it is hip geometry, but perhaps it's also the dosing of the drug too. Excellent, thank you very much.